That was my six-year-old's Teddy, imaginatively called Ted, rocking out to Carrie Bell and Sweet Little Woman. Welcome to A British Audio File and this episode in which I'm going to talk about my experiences of living with the Chord Mojo over the last 12 months. I'm going to focus on how it compares with other DACs, the Chord Hugo, DACs from Audiolab, Hegel and a very inexpensive Fio Tyson. Now, chord DACs are raved about in audiophile circles in terms of producing class-leading quality, and that's attributed to the FPGA technology inside their DACs. So what's all the fuss about? Now, in order to explain the benefits of FPGA technology, I need to get into a little bit of detail about sampling theory and the problems associated with analog to digital and digital to analog conversion. Now, for you technophobes out there, don't worry, I'll try and keep this as simple as I possibly can. So music by its very nature is analog. It's a waveform or a series of waveforms. And in the studio, an analog to digital converter converts that analog waveform into a digital signal by a process called quantization and sampling. So what is quantization and what is sampling? Quantization is assigning a value to the level of the music and sampling is how often you take that value. Now it goes without saying that the more values you have available, the more accurately you can describe the signal and the more often you take that sample, again in theory, the more accurately you'll be able to describe that signal. The number of quantization steps or levels available relates to the bit depth. Now 16 bits, which is CD quality, relates to about 65,000 levels. 24 bits is approximately 16 million and 32 bits is approximately 4 billion. So you can see as you increase the bit depth how dramatically the resolution improves. Well that's quantization, what about sampling? It turns out there's a theory by Shannon and Nyquist that stood for 90 years and has never been disproven and it states this, in order to reconstruct a frequency perfectly, all you need to do is sample it twice. Now the highest frequency that we need to sample is 20,000 Hertz, that's the limit of human hearing if you're lucky. And therefore you only need a sampling frequency of 40,000 Hertz, while well, CDs produce a sampling frequency of 44.1, so they're more than adequate. So what's the point of sample rates in excess of 44.1 kilohertz? You'll see high resolution formats with sample rates of up to 192 kilohertz. I think I've got one recording with a sample rate of 384 kilohertz. Now it's true, you don't need that level of sample rate to reconstruct audio frequencies. It's all to do with the time interval between one sample and the next. 44.1 kilohertz relates to a time interval between samples of 22 microseconds. And that isn't enough. Our human ear can detect differences in time intervals of four to five microseconds. So if you increase the sample rate, you're more accurately able to record timing information. Now that's really important because it turns out that that accurate timing information relates to our perception of pitch, timber, our ability to define leading transients in notes, spatial cues in terms of being able to place instruments in a sound stage, whether it be left or right, forward or backwards. These are all things you want to preserve very accurately in a highly resolving system. The great benefit, therefore, of high resolution formats is predominantly not just the increased resolution, but the preservation of timing information which relates to timber and pitch. Now there's other benefits of high resolution formats with regards to noise shaping and filtration, but I don't want this to become a video about the virtues of high res formats. 
the vast majority of music out there is still CD quality and the job of reconstructing that digital signal back into an analog uh, form falls upon your DAC, digital to analog converter. Inside every DAC is an interpolation filter. Now the job of an interpolation filter is to take the digital signal and to reconstruct the original analog waveform. Now it does that by oversampling and then filling in the gaps, that's the interpolation part. Theoretically it is possible for an interpolation filter to perfectly reconstruct that analog waveform, but that isn't the case in any DAC. The reality is that in order to perfectly reconstruct that, you need something which is a sync function, which is mathematically and theoretically possible, but in practical terms, it needs an infinite amount of processing power. Now, this is where Chord's FPGA technology comes into play. In conventional DACs, be it from ESS, Texas Instruments, AKM, or a number of other manufacturers, not a lot of processing power is dedicated towards the interpolation filter. They're more interested in getting the frequency response right. Timing information in those general purpose DACs is a secondary consideration. That's not true of chord DACs, which use an FPGA. FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. They're huge DSP engine chips where you can essentially dedicate as much processing power as the designer once, in this case Rob Watts, who pays an awful lot of attention to that interpolation filter. He claims that that interpolation filter inside a chord DAC will have, by minimum standards, 500 times the processing power of a conventional chip. And the amount of hardware within that DSP engine that he dedicates towards that filter he calls the tap length. Now there's more benefits to having an FPGA DAC than just having a bigger, more powerful interpolation filter in the right hands. Having a fully programmable DSP engine means that you can have a more effective noise shaper. You can deal more effectively with something called noise floor modulation, but I'm not gonna get into that today because I have a feeling that people's eyes will glaze over. So how many taps do the different chord DACs have? Well, the entry level chord DAC is this one, the Mojo, and it has 38,000 taps. The next level above this is the Hugo 2 and the desktop version of that, which is the cutest, that has 49,000 taps. A level above that is the Hugo TT2, which has 98,000 taps, and the top of the range chord DAC is the Dave with 164,000 taps. So, that's enough about the tech side of it. Time to look at what this thing sounds like. How does the Chord Mojo sound and in comparison to other DACs that I own? Well, this is a Fio Taishin. It's an inexpensive DAC that you can purchase off Amazon for 25 pounds. And the Chord retails for 400 pounds. As you'd expect, it sounds an awful lot better. There's nothing wrong with this DAC. It represents excellent value at 25 pounds and in the right system it's absolutely fine. Connected to two 300 pound amplifiers driving two 300 pound loudspeakers, this is perhaps all the DAC you need. But in this system, it doesn't have the re refinement or the resolution that this system deserves. So another comparison and perhaps a fairer one would be with this, the Audiolab QDAC. Now this is lesser known than the Audiolab MDAC, which is essentially a very similar DAC. This is a little cheaper. Um, it retailed for 400 pounds when they were making it. It's basically an MDAC with less connections and a slightly cheaper chip inside. So, fair comparison. 400 pound DAC from four or five years ago with the Chord Mojo, which is a 400 pound DAC today. Chord Mojo is significantly better in every area, in terms of resolution, in terms of timing, in terms of musicality. It's a significant improvement. Nothing wrong with this DAC, it just shows how the game has moved on in the last four or five years. So, moving up a level, I have a Hegel H160, which has an inbuilt DAC, 
which is based on the outgoing HD11 Hegel DAC. That was a DAC that retailed for a thousand pounds. And again, how does the Mojo compare with that? Well, now you're talking about DACs at a similar level. So it just shows how good this Cord Mojo is if it's able to compete with DACs from two, three years ago that were a thousand pounds. The Hegel has slightly faster, cleaner sound. The Mojo is a little bit larger sounding, a bit fuller, richer sounding, and it's a question of personal preference which one you prefer, the Hegel over the Mojo. One of the most interesting comparisons is how the Mojo compares with the Hugo. Now I'm talking about the Hugo 1, not the Hugo 2. Now why that's interesting is that the Mojo has a newer, more powerful FPGA chip inside than the Hugo 1. This has 38,000 taps and the Hugo 1 has 26,000 taps. So it'll be interesting to see, did this young upstart that retails for 400 pounds outperform a Hugo, which four or five years ago was a 1400 pound DAC? I'd love to say it did, but unfortunately it didn't. The Hugo is basically a refined version of this. Don't get me wrong, the Mojo is an excellent DAC, particularly for the money. But in comparison to the Hugo, the Hugo has better defined bass notes. It has the same extension, it's just leaner and faster in the bass. Similar transients in the mid-range are better defined. Um, there's a more spatial quality and separation around instruments. There's that kind of airy quality to the treble, whereas it's slightly rolled off in this. It just goes to show there's more to a DAC than the chip inside, even an FPGA chip. So am I saying that Mojo owners should go and rush out and buy a Chord Hugo 2? Can't buy a Hugo 1 anymore. Well, that depends on the resolution of your system. And I think you need something at a minimum level of say a KEF LS50 or BMW 700 series, those are quite common brands, something at that level, preferably something better, ATCs, Proax, PMCs, driven by a very good quality mid-range integrated amp. Now what do I mean by that? I mean something like a name XS2, 1500 pounds worth of Arcam, Rager, um, or equivalent dedicated amplifiers to be able to tell the difference. Otherwise, you're better off spending your money upgrading your amplifier or upgrading your speakers. So hopefully you found this review useful, gained something from it. Please like, share, subscribe. But for today, for now, a British Audiophile signing off.